My guest today is Wade Allison. I'm an academic. Uh, I've written four books, uh, three of them to do with nuclear uh, power. And, uh, but I was getting to the end of my first uh, uh, popular one when I realized that I had never actually been to a nuclear power station. So I put that in, uh, corrected that, and I've now been to them uh, all over the world. That was back in uh, 2006, um, uh, long before Fukushima. And uh, as a result at that time, I, talking with people, I realized that there's a job to do simply putting the worlds that we know about of, new, of natural science into simple terms uh, and taking the fear out of uh, uh, fear out of things. Anyway, I've spent my life teaching physics to some very clever students at Oxford uh, and uh, doing research at CERN and so on. Um, but I've also spent a lot of time working, looking at uh, the effect of radiation on uh, us, on people, um, and that's what I want to bring together with the. Uh, with the nuclear side. Very good. All right. And you do have a presentation. Should we go ahead and uh, run through that? Sure. Okay. Some stories are exciting. We all enjoy a uh, mystery tinged with fear. We inherit the reactions of fear and excitement from our animal ancestry. But the consequences can easily go awry when the story mixes, confuses fact and fiction. An important case is the tale of what happened at Fukushima Daiichi in March 2011. The first big nuclear accident caught on camera. It had to be exciting. So it was billed as a disaster by the media, except that it wasn't. The nuclear death toll was zero. But the story itself had dangerous consequences. The world should sober up and think more clearly about its love-hate relationship with energy. That is what I want to talk about today, putting fear and excitement in their place and, in fact, telling a much more positive story. Abundant energy is essential for life. When life began some three billion years ago, the only sources of energy, the only sources of energy were the daily sunshine and the occasional volcanic geyser at a crack in the Earth's crust. Whenever those sources failed, life's activity faded too. Evolution engineer, engineered a beautiful step forward in the use of energy. The extraordinary development of food and digestion enabled life, animals, birds, and fish, each with their own personal internal engine to move around and survive seasonal deprivation. However, the energy available to each individual was limited to the capacity of their own digestive system. This hurdle was overcome in the fire technology revolution, a revolution unique to mankind, a revolution enabled by the ability to study, understand, take sensible risks, and to teach each other in society what had been found. Still today, humans retain an unnatural fear of energy and prefer sources that are weak and they think less threatening. But that is not the way we came to, do not to dominate life on the planet. Animals are limited by the food they eat, but modern humans have an appetite for some hundred times more energy. Where can this energy come from? And how well can it be controlled? And also fears of it uh, 
how it can feels it reined in by education and understanding, and so shared with society at large. The acceptance of the use of fire was the turning point in human civilization. Of course, fire is dangerous, and the proto Green Party 600,000 years ago was right. But fortunately, their protests were overridden. Otherwise, human civilization would never have attained its preeminent position. The discipline of handling fire had to be learnt and handed down to children at, with strict instruction from an early age, as it still is today. Fire can catch and spread like a virus, all-consuming, which, incidentally, to anticipate what is to come later, neither radioactivity nor the, its radiation can do. Far is put to work with knowledge and care based on experience, not with over-enthusiasm or, or superstition. Adam Smith, the economist, put it, science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Or as Mary Curie expressed it, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so that more, so that we may fear less. But we should distinguish natural science, that is what na how nature works, from technology, that is the exciting ways in which humans may put science to work. We should check obvious ev evidence, for it can deceive. Medical experience shows that the truth is not always simple to establish. It is well known that those who think they have been treated medically, when they have not, have an improved rate of recovery. This is called the placebo effect. The nocebo effect, its nasty uh, variant, occurs when people genuinely think, genuinely suffer by thinking that they have been injured when they haven't been. News that you have been irradiated and are being evacuated from your home acts like a curse or voodoo, and people genuinely fall ill. As in testing vaccines, establishing the truth requires blind trials and innocent subjects. Nature's food-powered engine has an important technical lesson for us. To work, its operating temperature, 37 Celsius, must be higher than ambient. Evaporation and sweating help, but an environment of 40 and 50 Celsius is not habitable without air conditioning and the energy to power it. The spread of uninhabitable regions, the rising tide of mass migration, and the availability of air conditioning are existential problems. So the ability of society uh, is particularly sensitive to changes in climate. And our food energy engine raises another point. Our bodies produce waste every day, and any, every failure, any failure to control it carefully causes pollution and supports infectious disease. We educate children at a very early age what to do, and we strict, restrict their social life until they learn. But what if we could find a source of energy, a fuel, with a million times the energy density of food? Then both the fuel and its waste would be about one kilogram for all the energy it needs of a life for one person. If such an ideal waste also did not support infections, had a clean safety record, and was simply contained and did not even smell, well, that would be close to perfection. Does such a perfect fuel and its perfect waste exist?
The universe is brimming with energy. But what is available on Earth now? We should look to the natural, to the natural science of energy. Its laws are extremely simple, though mercilessly strict. The first law says, energy cannot be made or destroyed under any circumstances. It may change form, but it must have come from somewhere, from a primary source. So secondary sources, like electricity and hydrogen, need to start from a primary source. And it's the availability of primary sources that is the central question. The second law says the concentrations of energy, that is fuel, need uh, tend to, dis to disperse or leak away. So boulders like to roll downhill, water likes to flow away, hot cups of coffee go cold, and two lukewarm cups of coffee cannot make one hot cup. So there is a premium on hot cups that is on high concentrations of energy. So, where might we find significant stores of primary energy that have not already dispersed? The Earth has been isolated except for sunlight for at least five billion years. Sunlight powers the wind and weather, but averages only about 600 watts per square meter altogether. So the renewable sources that depend on this, uh, on sunlight, uh, um, need vast areas of nature. How anyone care who cares about the environment can advocate them is puzzling. Here is a picture of a meadow near Abingdon in Oxfordshire. It's not a farm. It's not green. It's certainly not environmental, but it's a picture of nature hijacked. The, the poet Wordsworth would weep. And what about wind? Here are some data from the daily of the daily production of the of the European Union plus the UK from Wind Europe report of 2021. The installed wind capacity is 236 gigawatts, but the daily maximum generated in on any year uh, in any on any day in the year was only 103 gigawatts. Evidently, wind is highly unreliable. Not only does it fluctuate, but the effect of its fluctuation uh, on the power that it can deliver is massively amplified because the power depends on the cube of the wind speed. Let's put that in, in, uh, in reality. For a perfect turbine, if the wind speed drops by 50%, the power it can develop drops to 12%, an eighth. The result is that wind power delivers only 20 to 30% of the time with offshore wind marginally better than onshore wind. As soon as fossil fuels and steam power became available, the, in the uh, uh, 18th, 19th, 19th century, the economic benefit of abandoning, abandoning renewables was clear. The chemical power of fossil fuel combustion offered reliability, 24 seven availability, and thousand times more energy density. A thousand tons of coal give as much energy as 10 million tons of water from a 100 meter high uh, hydroelectric dam. Consequently, the wretched pre-industrial standard of living was transformed by the Industrial Revolution. The population quadrupled and the life expectancy doubled. Suddenly, there was, there was time for sport, 
and vacations and no need for slavery. Pollock's politics came to be dominated by the question of who had access to fossil fuels and who didn't. And this left three concerns that we have today. Fossil fuels polluted the pollute the environment, especially in large cities, and were far from safe. The pos secondly, the possible effect of fossil fuels on the global environment and climate change. And thirdly, the scientific question, where is the mechanism of chemical energy? Unlike wind and solar and hydro, it seems to be hidden. You can't feel it. You can't see it. Even could there be other hidden energies? The scientific question was answered in 1924, that's 99 years ago, by a young French PhD student, Prince Louis de Broglie. In his thesis, he suggested that all particles and light should be described by waves. In this most famous photograph, he appears along with Planck, Einstein, Mary Curie, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, and some of the other brilliant people who checked out that this wave mechanics applies universally to everything. The waves for all matter have a wavelength h over mb, where h is Planck's constant, 6.6, 10-34 to minus 34 joule seconds. And m is the mass in kilogram, and v in, is the speed of the matter in seconds. That is the only unfamiliar bit. Like a sound wave in a musical instrument of size L, the wavelength is 2L. So if you have a smaller musical instrument, get a higher pitch. Its kinetic energy is then energy half mv squared as usual, which is h squared over 8ml squared. Though universal, the energy only becomes significant when L and M are small. There are adjustments for three dimensions, become uh, harmonics, etc., but these are small. For an electron trapped in an atom, the size is L is 10 to minus 10 meters, and the energy that comes out of this calculation, this simple formula, is four electron volts. That is the right energy scale for all of chemical batteries, lasers, food, electronics, explosives, etc. And it's a thousand times the energy density available from hydro and solar and wind. But then, for a proton and neutron inside a nucleus, the nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 meters in size, a hundred thousand times smaller. And this formula goes like one of real square. So the energy is 20 million electron volts. That is the scale of nuclear energy. That is the story of the last 50 years, although people have not understand it. This nuclear energy is 5 million times the chemical fuels. Uh, and the fossil fuels, basically because the nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller. The rest, as they say, is history, but the future too. The quantity of fuel acquired and the waste created are correspondingly reduced. Indeed, one kilogram of pure nuclear fuel can provide all the energy for one person for life. Not only their food, but their transport, their heating, uh, uh, and everything else. There are just two conditions. The power plants need to be actually built, and the public need to be reassured and educated, and indeed as they were when fire was int successfully introduced. Otherwise, it didn't work.
Since the thousandfold increase in energy density transformed society in the Industrial Revolution, the further factor of 5 million available from nuclear energy should offer an ever greater uh, social uplift in future. As Winston Churchill recently, brilliantly observed already in the Strand magazine in 1931, the discovery and control of such a source of power would cause changes in human affairs incomparably greater than those produced in the steam uh, and in the steam engine four generations ago. I'm not quite sure how he understood this, but he was certainly talking to the right people, and he was right. Whilst he had the vision, it was another 25 years before it was demonstrated that nuclear energy could be delivered under control and to water. Indeed, so effective is the natural security of nuclear energy that, that society thinks that it is man-made and unnatural, a view that has dogged the public image, its public image for seven decades. Nuclear energy is the only road to future prosperity, but decision-making is still weighed down by public unease, exacerbated by unscientific regulation, particularly in democratic regimes. Note that in 2022, only China started the construction of a, nuclear, of a new nuclear power plant, and of the 31 reactors that started construction since 2017, all but four are based on Russian and Chinese designs. The public unease stems from concerns about safety and the effect of radiation on life. Einstein gave the first successful description of what happens when ionizing radiation hits any material. The damage is confined to a small number of randomly chosen sites, atoms or molecules, that are, are, uh, that are smashed exceptionally hard, while the rest are unaffected. In 1905, Einstein related this to quantum theory. work for which he received his Nobel Prize. In the case of living tissue, this has enabled evolution to find ways to circumvent the damage, replace the cells, repairing broken DNA and other strategies, while relying on the fact that the other undamaged healthy, the, uh, the uh, undamaged health of the majority of cells. The attacking radiation is powerful, but its strategy doesn't change. Biology is weak, but over billions of years, it has established ways to recover. This contrasts with, it, with an attack by a virus. The attack by a virus is weak, but also evolves, so that the contest with living tissue is not so easily settled as we know from COVID. Education is how society evolves. The accident at Fukushima Daiichi illustrate its effect. First came the earthquake and the tsunami that killed nearly 20,000 people. But at school in Japan, every child learns about these and practices what to do. So despite the huge loss of life, society recovered. However, when the nuclear reactors failed and some radiation was released, nobody knew what to do because they'd never been told. The region was hurriedly and non unnecessarily evacuated with the loss of some 1,600 lives. 
although not a single life was affected by the radiation itself. Society lost confidence in science and, and in authority. Locally, there were serious consequences for mental health, the economy, and the consumption of fossil fuels. The panic spread around the world on a media-driven wave of excitement. None of this would happen if the discussion at home and school about the natural world that properly includes fire and human waste had not excluded radioactivity and its radiation. Our note in radiation from the sun, ultraviolet, is a serious cause of skin cancer. Protection from this more serious problem is properly handled in family health care, and sunbathing is not regulated by an arm of the United Nations. Is there any evidence against such, against a more positive attitude towards radiation safety? As pointed out earlier, blind trials and innocent subjects are needed. Blind trials with mice and dogs in controlled laboratory condition are supportive, but most appealing are the available videos of wild animals in the evacuation zone at Chernobyl, made by BBC and others. These animals have never seen the shock horror videos and stories about what happened at Chernobyl. The wildlife is seen as thriving, glad to be rid of the human population, and free to, to, to roam undisturbed in their park. But the evolved protection against the effect of ionizing radiation is effective only to a certain level. The mechanism takes time to act, like all biological reactions, hours or days, depending on the cell cycle. They may be overwhelmed at a certain threshold, if a certain threshold is exceeded in a month, say. These questions have been studied for more than a century since Mary Curie's day. First, radiation, since Matt, since Mary Curie first used radiation to diagnose and cure cancers. The radiation is most easily described graphically, for, for instance, with circles of area proportional to a monthly dose. The red, circles sh shows, the red circle shows a dose that is usually fatal to cells, including cancer cells. The yellow circle is a monthly dose from which most tissue recovers. For instance, the otherwise healthy tissue near a, a treated uh, tumor. Everyone has a friend or relative who has had such treatment and have lived to enjoy more years of life. The green circle is 200 times smaller also shown magnified. This describes a monthly dose which is, as internationally agreed in 1934, has no record of comparable harm. Much has been discovered since 1934, but nothing that faults this value. But in 1945, nuclear energy was used for war like chemistry was used for war. Much worse, the 1950s was an era of worldwide secrecy, fear, and distrust, fermented by Senator Joseph McCarthy. Since that time, the world, led by the United States, has demonized nuclear energy and exaggerated the caution a thousand times without scientific evidence. The currently recommended regulation for the public correspond to the area of the little, tiny, tiny white circle in the diagram. 
why have we allowed this to happen and to persist for 70 years? We should understand that nuclear and its radiation can be beneficial, not, uh, not only for personal health, but for society and the environment. The naive and unscientific assumption that a little radiation is harmful because, the, uh, because that is true of an excess has caused great loss of life at Fukushima, has escalated the cost of nuclear power by a huge factor, and delayed uh, it by many years without reason. There is no expensive item in, nuclear, in a nuclear reactor except the unwarranted fear that obstructs nuclear power. Uh, and of course, there's the, the, uh, uh, the, the know-how to do it. A new station is an exceptional investment that would work 24-7 for 80 years. We need urgently to invest in the talents of our young people. And Guitar, most of those committees set up to protect our grandchildren from their own, uh, from their own future and the energy revolution that they will surely need. So it is primarily a matter for education and legislative reform, and that will take time. But the revolution to come will will outshine the Industrial Revolution, as Churchill foresaw those, those 90 years ago. Domestically in the UK, the supporters of nuclear energy, an independent organization, is encouraging the younger generation to express themselves. In the USA, uh, as, a, as it happens, recently the president of the Health Physics Society Dr. John Cardarelli, together with seven previous presidents, wrote to the U.S. Congress, emphasizing the need to oversee the, the incorporation of the latest scientific uh, standards, latest science into the radiation protection standards for low-dose environments. As widely acknowledged, these standards have been incompatible with science, scientific evidence, for 70 years, with serious consequences for, so for society, for the environment, and for energy supplies. These matters should be re-examined worldwide. More generally, we should take note of Churchill's prediction. So, fasten your seatbelts and prepare for change. Study, read books, explore links and articles on the, uh, the uh, uh, website of supports of nuclear energy, for instance, including details of the five of the competition that the young in the UK are invited to, to uh, enter. The future will be turbulent, but can that can ultimately be positive if we start building nuclear now in the places where people live and work. Fantastic stuff. Do you have time to answer some questions? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that uh, a decade, um, whatever it takes. Excellent. Yeah, as I said before we hit record, I've been uh, consuming your uh, podcasts and uh, reading online versions of your books, and I think your your message is just absolutely critical, and I think you're doing a great job. Um, I did want to point out that your books are available for download. I needed to read them uh, in a hurry, so Radiation and Reason and Nuclear is for Life. Well, we can download those and read those, and I'll put those in the show description so people can take a look there. The, the hard copy is also available, but I usually get crucified by the postage. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's available on Amazon, but I get stuck with the, with the bureaucracy of Amazon sometimes. But I just posted some this morning. Uh, I posted some to Germany and some. Uh, but I've got, because uh, nobody would publish those books. So uh, I self-published them. 
which is not difficult, but you uh, you have to all the, the financing and the bureaucracy to, to cope with. But I have a, a thousand copies of both books in my uh, garage. So if you want an actual a book in your hand, give or take the postage, we can arrange that. So those books are just packed with actual data and stuff. But why would anybody say we're not going to publish this book? Well, what motivates people? Uh, they, I'm trying to remember his name, but it, 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 uh, uh, nuclear is for life. Um, it's difficult to persuade somebody of something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Now, most people, children and pensioners apart, most people are locked into their career, the source of their salary, the source of their uh, health support uh, in the US, uh, and uh, they're not free to say, uh, to change their mind on everything. So the people, if you're head of a UN committee, on radiological protection, uh, and I have spoken uh, with such people, uh, with, they are committed. It says uh, above their door, on their door, I am the president of the International Commission for Radiological Protection. Now, the fact that the radiation is can, at lower dose is good for you, uh, and I didn't speak about it today, but it actually lowers the probability of you getting other kinds of, of uh, cancer and so on. Uh, this is not welcome for, most people don't understand it, and those who do understand it don't welcome it because it takes away their, and that's another problem, that all of this involves a mix between physical science, uh, determined by maths and so on, engineers and programming, uh, and biology and medicine, which is an entirely different discipline of works on entirely different rules. Uh, and I have actually, I uh, um, gave a medical physics course at Oxford for 20 years. Uh, and uh, so I've worked on both sides of, of this, but not many people have, unless they're people whose salary is being paid to deny it. So you have an interesting story you've told elsewhere about uh, training for a marathon, two different approaches for getting ready for a marathon. What was that? Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Well, a physicist looks at this problem of energy and says, my goodness, energy is conserved. Uh, if I go in for a marathon, I've got to, um, I've got to uh, build up all the energy that I can before I enter for the marathon. Marathon. So he goes to bed for a week. He has a fantastically regulated uh, diet uh, uh, and ready for the big day. And the biologist says, I don't believe all that. And he goes and does a little bit of a marathon, a little bit more each day, and he trains himself and his body learns. To uh, it evolves to the the storage of energy uh, inside his body, and on the day of the marathon comes and the physicist and biologist line up, and uh, after the first mile and a half, uh, the the sound of ambulances are heard because the physicist has collapsed, uh, and the biologist goes on to win the thing. Now, I'm a physicist. I'm brought up in mathematics, but there are things to which it does not apply. And half of this problem, the, the, uh, us, the us side, the human tissue side, it does not apply, uh, but it does apply on the other side. Yeah, so you've talked in detail. I love this stuff about you talking about a flash of intense radiation can be can be very dangerous to you, but a, a smaller amount of radiation spread out over time, your body repairs itself, and that actually can be good for you, right? A small amount of radiation can be good for your body. That's right. It, it's it's exercise. I mean, it's not. It's like uh, if you run 
too much in one day, then a marathon will uh, uh, cause you serious health, have serious health consequences. But if you do a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, in the end, you can run a marathon. So uh, biology has been working on this problem for 3,000 million years, and it knows what to do. Another thing that you've talked about, I find uh, very instructive, is the uh, number of people who died of cancer from the radiation at Hiroshima and Nagasaki versus the number of people who died from panic in Fukushima. You talk yeah, about panic. that? Yeah. Well, of course, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or at least from, a, a, from it, it took a few years for, to get organized, but since 1950, there are... Uh, uh, reliable rep medical reports on 100,000 survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and that's all in the literature. Um, and uh, I don't think it's controvertible. Uh, um, of course, most people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki who died, died from the fire and the blast, because the fire, the blast and the fire are much bigger than from a a chemical bomb, um, or, or almost on the scale of the chemical uh, explosion in um, in, uh, in 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 Lebanon a couple of years years ago. So it's just the size of the blast and the fire that causes the the uh, the damage. Now some people did get uh, um, cancer in the years after in the 50 years after the after Hiroshima and Nagasaki and those have been chronicled very carefully and compared with the number of people also in Japan with the same ages etc uh, who who uh, who were not at Hiroshima and Nagasaki but who also died and it, in comparing these two sets of people you can see what the effect of the radiation was and uh there are uh uh i can't remember the number it's it's, it's in the, it's in the book uh two or three three hundred four hundred uh extra um, cancer deaths uh 93 extra leukemia deaths and there are so many people in a hundred thousand that these numbers are quite reliable um uh and uh people don't tend to uh, argue uh, with them. Um, and uh, as I say, that is a, a few hundred. But the number of people who died from uh, being moved out of old people's homes after Fukushima, it was particularly the elderly uh, who had to be uh, who didn't have to be, but were uh, uh, lifted out of their homes and panicked off uh, um, instead of giving them the time and, and so on. Um, and I'd been to to uh, Fukushima four times, and I'd been uh, visited uh, the evacuation uh, site and talked with uh, uh, an evacuee and so on, um, who. In, interestingly, initially, uh, took to drugs and drink. Uh, this is what happened at Chernobyl as well. The, we're talking about social consequences, a breakup of marriage, bedwetting of children, and so on. These are the kinds of things, not, uh, uh, not physics. Um, that's, that's, that, that's what... Uh, Fear of radiation does to people. Just an and, Go ahead. So, not it, it not only to people, but it does to the authorities as well. And the authorities, who also don't know what they're doing, their panic is to protect their liability. Of course, um, uh, they don't want to be liable for the obviously. Things have gone terribly wrong, and they don't want to be liable for it. So they play a very cautious game uh, and compete with one another 
in the uh, in the provision of caution um, and make matters even worse. I think you've mentioned that uh, from the media's perspective, it's a lot more attractive to present this as the worst thing ever versus it's really not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, saying it's not that bad is a terribly dull way. Of, I mean, I haven't seen the Oppenheimer uh, um, video. Uh, I must steal myself and, and watch it, but I'm, I, I, know, I know that I'm going to be horrified. Uh, um, but, of course, from the likes of, of Oppenheimer um, at the end of the Second World War, he knew how frail uh, our society is and unable to cope with things. He, from experience, knew, dealing with General Groves and others, that he couldn't trust uh, the political and the military people with this factor of a million, five million, in fact, that the physics delivers. Uh, and that's the problem. How do you sell such an enormous factor to society without society destroying itself? And he rightly uh, was not thought that it would destroy people, um, and uh, it may still do so. But uh, they could also have said that about fire 600,000 years ago, whenever it was. Um, uh, if you don't study it, uh, you will it will it will consume you. If you learn to tame it, um, and that is a matter of studying, then uh, it will serve you very well. So, I I understand where Oppenheimer was coming from, but no, I haven't seen the I haven't seen the film. It's just an anecdote, but you want to tell us a little bit about the story of the guy who survived both Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Oh, yeah, but that, this, of course, is, I mean, it goes the other way, but it's bad science to take one case and make a story out of it. But it's still, there is a, a documented case of one guy who was in Hiroshima on the fatal day, and uh, the bomb dropped, and he survived, uh, but he uh, just managed to get out and uh, go home to Nagasaki, uh, and um, he got bombed again, uh, and he died uh, a, a few, quite recently at the age of ninety-three, um, uh, ha having survived both. But uh, I think there are half a dozen such people. That's no way to do science. Uh, you've got to look for innocent victims of innocent uh, uh, subjects for uh, much better to study uh, to study animals. Uh, I wanted to ask about, uh, do you have thoughts on other people I've had on my podcast on their work, uh, Cal Abel, um, Ed Calabrese, B.F. Randall? Oh, yeah. Robert yeah. Zubrin? I, I mean, Ed, Ed Calabrese is... Um, a very important his his work is extremely important uh to my mind he is working a bit close to the page um uh because he is applying uh he's still applying mathematics to uh the relationship between radiation and uh and the reaction to it. Um, I think that his work shows that radiation is not uh, is not subject to mathematics in, in this way, in the sense that the biology learns how to react to radiation. But when the radiation comes, the biology then changes. So that it should happen again. It's not the same description as happened last time. So there is no, you can't write down relationship between radiation and its consequences because it changes. Now, I, I'm, I'm, 
needless to say, I'm writing another book, but uh, I don't know when that'll, maybe I should get it published with a proper publisher, um, uh, which actually looks at this business of, seriously looks at this business of whether mathematics uh, should even be applicable uh, to biology. Ed Calabrese is concerned with the history of why the naive linear theory uh, is not applicable. But uh, I think it's the to go further than that. So yes, I'm step. If you like it, I'm, I I I would uh, admit to standing on his shoulders. You have a great quote here. Uh, quote: The only business of biology is to to protect life from attack. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, I mean, what? Um, what the only the only reason that biology is let's play God for a moment. If you wanted to say, okay, I'm going to put life on Earth. Now, I could have one big life, uh, an autocratic, a, a, a big life which, uh, with, with one uh, uh, control system, but that would be very vulnerable. It was much cleverer to make life as lots of us different. Yeah. And some of us will survive and some of us won't. And the variety between the way that each of us thinks and works will mean that uh, we will that life will go on, and anyway, uh, life arranges through the miracle of of uh, of uh, sex and birth and death and so on, replaces each of us uh, uh, quite regularly. In my case, not too not quite soon, um, um, uh, and we. We know all of that. And what's interesting is that at a cellular level, the same story is happening. There are millions of cells. They can, if some of them get clobbered, then uh, through the Einstein's photoelectric effect, some of them get clobbered, but most of them weren't. Uh, and so all you've got to do is get rid of the ones that have got clobbered and life will carry on in spite of the fact radiation is so powerful compared with uh with the forces that keep life going so the whole of life has designed around uh um these two levels of of uh, survival by having lots of different varieties and throwing some of them away of course darwinian selection is horribly cruel i don't think uh, some of our moral ideas fit into this very well. They get ditched because the suffering of of uh, Darwinian selection is uh, part of the game. Um, only a few survive. Uh, we don't like political systems that work like that. Uh, but we've got an uphill uphill uh, job trying to to. Uh, to control our politics and our economics to be have any sort of equality, but biology tends to be unequal. Um, and anyway, maybe I've answered your question. Maybe I haven't. I go on. I'm learning all the time. Um, and my two books, uh, the first one was written before uh, Fukushima, but I learned a lot more uh, since then. Uh, hence the second book, uh, and what I know, learning, thinking about now and learning, uh, will go beyond that. So one thing you've talked about in general terms is a problem in science or maybe in uh, human life in general, too much specialization, people go down in oh, one yeah. area. No, well, that's a, this is a criticism of education. I mean, when we, we say to a 12-year-old a, a, a boy, what what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you, it's exciting. What are you going to specialize in? 
Well, actually, that is quite the wrong thing to be saying, because especially with AI, we should not have to do quite so much work, uh, and we can spend more time uh, educating ourselves and educating others, as well as looking after the very uh, young and very old. Uh, those are going to be our principal occupations. So we've got to all learn much more uh, and not compartmentalize our understanding of our lives and saying, oh, that's that's physics. That's not my uh, that's not my area. Uh, these are if we're going to survive or maximize our chance of surviving, we all need to understand a lot more. And education needs. Uh, um, I, that's where I, I've been all, all my life. But I learned an enormous amount from uh, from teaching. Um, uh, and it happens at the boundaries between. And the most successful technical advances are when two ways of thinking collide. Uh, it's at the boundaries between the application of, of uh, physics to biology or biology to, to, uh, to physics. So even as uh, talking to uh, people in the financial markets, what they should be looking for is, is where you've got uh, different ways of thinking suddenly colliding or getting, uh, making contact for the first time. That's where exciting things are going to happen. So yes, I think uh, education has a lot of changes to make. Uh, one thing you have said about education is an important aim of education should be to encourage everyone to challenge accepted opinion. I really agree with that. Yeah, but of course they don't. Um, people are much too cautious. Um, perhaps it's as well if we do want a quiet life as well. I, I'm I'm not a revolutionary. Uh, um, I just want people to look at books and think and dare to ask one another. Um, I tell you, I, I, well, I've learned working on energy all my, all my life. I suppose I, as a 13 year old boy, I happened to be in Geneva and uh, I um, visited uh, the uh, exhibition that was on in Geneva. And it was Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace exhibition, and it was 1954. Uh, not many people go back that far. Um, but uh, it's that sort of, uh, um, I think I, I think my education became too narrow, but wonderful things happened when it broadened out again. We're coming up on an hour here. I just have one more quote here from you that uh, I'm gonna ask for comment. It's the conclusion from your uh, nuclear is for life. It says, there are new, no nuclear dragons to fear, but then there never were. The only dragon is the blind application of the precautionary principle. Well, the, the precautionary principle is really is a disaster. Uh, this was the superficial idea that uh, the way to deal with problems is to take all possible precautions to deal with them. When in fact, precaution over, it is right that when a new technology arrives, uh, as for instance, now with AI, I think, you, you do have to ask some questions and questions that haven't been asked before. And you have to err on the side of caution. But then as soon as possible, you need to dispense with that caution and to stop being so cautious in order that you can exploit it. And I'm sure with AI that will, uh, we should exploit it, but we need to know more about it. And I'm certainly not an expert on that. Although, I mean, I've used AI to kind of techniques in, in uh, doing experiments at CERN and so on. 
uh, when you have computer programs that actually learn themselves into the problem you're, uh, that you're looking at. But that was uh, a, a small and superficial. So, uh, yeah, precaution has to be used very sparingly um, for things that are new. All right, I just wanted to mention that you are on Twitter at Radiation Reason. I'll put that link in the show description. Any other points you'd like to make before we do uh, yeah, finish well, up? Uh, uh, well, that's my, um, I have an email. Uh, it's not a very common name, so wade.allison at gmail.com uh, will, will reach me uh, amongst others. Um, uh, the support of nuclear energy, uh, I've just come back from um, a, a week in Korea uh, trying to reassure them and I told them that with an explanation that uh, I would be happy to drink uh, a litre of the uh, water that has, they're all worried about releasing from, um, from the, the back end of the Fukushima uh, um, uh, story. Um, and, but that wasn't a dare. That wasn't, that wasn't, a, that was a result of me calculating that the radioactivity in my blood is already as big as the effect of drinking a, a glass of that water. And they were worried about putting that water into the ocean and contaminating the ocean? Oh, yeah. they're worried about putting it into the ocean. But I'm saying, and I told them so, and I, I did, did it in a, a, a press conference, and to give them their, their due, the politicians got me in by the end of the, I was only there for a week, that was on the Monday. On the Friday, uh, I was sitting in front of a parliamentary committee uh, in their Houses of Parliament, talking to them about radiation protection. But they, still you... but they still worried about it. I think you're doing great work. Uh, any other any other uh, things you'd like to say before we finish up? Well, I don't know. How, I don't know how lo long I've got, but I can tell you that it's certainly good for your health to worry about things like this because it gives a a a, a purpose and a and a, a direction of of what I do every day. Glad to hear it. All right, thank you very much. I'd love to have you on. Thank again. you. If you're available. Talk to you next time, Wade Allison. Yeah.